I'm a filmmaker, and I'm going to pitch you a story that could change the world. It starts in the past, and it ends in the future. But how it's going to turn out is going to be up to you. Are you ready for it? <laughs> when I was just one year old, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII, into law. Equal employment opportunity for women was now guaranteed. It was revolutionary. It was the biggest legal step forward for American women since we won the right to vote in 1920. It meant my generation of women could dream of pursuing careers in whatever professions we chose. Or could we? <laughs> Turns out, for many of us, Title VII was and still is just an illusion, especially in Hollywood, the land of illusions, where I went to be a film director but ended up making my mark as a troublemaker. I'm the one who instigated the biggest industry-wide investigation into discrimination against women directors in Hollywood history. I exposed the legal infractions that stand at the heart of the current gender problem in America's dream machine. Infractions that are the killers of dreams. When I was a little girl, my favorite thing to do was dream. Growing up near the rainforest in Puerto Rico, and the dunes of Cape Cod. I had vivid dreams. Watching my first films in movie theaters felt a lot like dreaming. I was captivated. At age 14, I saw Swept Away, a movie directed by a woman named Lena Wertmuller. And that's what greenlit my dream to become a film director. By my 20s, I was relentlessly pursuing that dream in Hollywood, starting as a student in a five-year directing program at UCLA's Graduate Film School. Thanks to another law, Title IX, half my class was men and half my class was women. Still, I should have seen trouble ahead. Almost 100% of the films we studied were directed by men, and virtually all our professors were men. Nevertheless, I was confident that with hard work and determination, I would soon join the pantheon of film directors I admired so much. At graduation, the legendary Francis Ford Coppola handed me my Master of Fine Arts diploma. He shook my hand and he said, good luck. <laughs> I really, really didn't think I'd need it. I was graduating at the top of my class, carrying an armful of writing and directing awards. I was handed $2 million to direct my first feature film in England with A-list actors and a top British crew. My film, When Saturday Comes, screened at Cannes and got theatrical distribution. I signed with the William Morris Agency in LA and was attached to direct several films. It was one of the best years of my life. It was 1995, and I was ready to launch. Well, who could have guessed that 1995 would be the year the number of female director hires hit its all-time peak? For the next 15 years, that number and my career would go into steady decline. I would never work again as a paid feature film director. I'd never direct a primetime TV show. And I was dropped by my agency. I watched as men who hadn't directed a feature film and at a half my training became wealthy and sought after TV directors. I watched as my male classmates and peers became the cinematic voices of our time. Believe me, I know the directing profession is fiercely competitive for guys too. But as Manola Dargis wrote in the New York Times, while individual men struggle in the industry, women struggle as a group. I became part of a lost generation of female voices in American cinema and television. Marginalized as a group, yet isolated from each other, we blamed ourselves for our individual failures. But deep down, we wondered, could it be the industry that was betraying us, failing us? Cut to, 
2011, I turned my director's chair toward activism. Here are the statistics that fueled my anger. In 2012, women directed only 13% of TV shows, just 4% of studio features, and a staggering 1% of the most lucrative category of directing, top commercials. Men were directing almost 100% of our entertainment media. Women didn't have a chance for equal opportunity or fair competition, and women directors of color, not even on the map. Turns out that Hollywood was, and still is, the worst violator of Title VII of any industry in the United States. Even the coal mining industry does better. It was time to become a troublemaker. I had to blow the whistle. My fight was not just about me or the few thousand other women directors missing out on jobs. It was my realization that the absence of women directors in Hollywood was tantamount to the censoring and silencing of female voices everywhere. Entertainment media is our nation's most culturally influential global export. It impacts the way people think and treat each other all around the world. Without equal participation of women's voices in our storytelling, the world is getting a skewed perspective of reality, leaving a two-class society cleaved by gender. What about our nation's founding ideals of equality and justice? What about the promises of our Constitution? I decided to make the personal political. Let me just give you a picture of how Hollywood works. With my first feature film under my belt, I spent hundreds of hours on set preparing to direct the TV show Law and Order. But the executive producer gave my hoped for episode to his stepson instead. I asked him why he thought so few women directors were getting hired and how to fix it. And he said, it's a real conundrum. We just don't know what to do about it. And I thought, a conundrum? Why don't you just start by hiring me? The problem seemed so simple to solve. Hire more women. And what the heck was going on with Title VII anyway? I decided to make the personal political. I headed to the courthouse in downtown LA to, see, to search for legal precedent to challenge Hollywood, and I learned about six courageous women directors who 30 years before had used Title VII to launch a class action lawsuit against several major studios. The work of the original six and the pressure of that legal action sent the number of female director hires soaring from one half of 1% to 16% in just 10 years, from 1985 to 1995, the very year I graduated. So the uptick in numbers didn't last long enough to help me, but it indicated a real industry vulnerability to legal action. Unfortunately, the law moves slowly, and I wanted to move fast. I needed to trigger a paradigm shift in the way people think about women directors. I wondered if I turned the spotlight on Title VII in Hollywood, could it become the small intervention that sparks a major social transformation? In the age of high-speed communication and networking, I thought so. So for the next two years, I articulated the problem as a civil rights crisis. I started a blog and used social media to, to marshal a community of women where there had been none before. I researched and wrote a legal brief. I wrote article after article exposing the problem from every possible angle. And I reached out to mainstream journalists to spread the word. Finally, when the New York Times called my work a veritable crusade, I knew I was getting somewhere. By 2013, I was elected the first ever women directors category representative in my union, the Directors Guild of America. With a small group of brave women directors, we spoke out and we produced the biggest summit for women directors ever held. 
Little did I know how entrenched our male-dominated DGA had become. The guild leadership retaliated. They forbade us from taking photographs at our summit, and they confiscated our contact list. They mandated bylaws to silence us and shut down our activism. We were blacklisted in the very union that is supposed to protect our rights. And we were not alone. Across the industry, women who speak out are out. Title VII can only work where speaking out is possible. I mean, think about it. If you can't get a job because you're a woman, but invoking the law to defend yourself means getting blacklisted, well, that means that law doesn't work. It was time for a radical plot twist and a new cast of characters. Enter the ACLU. In the spring of 2013, I, I took my evidence to the American Civil Liberties Union, and their senior attorneys took the time to listen. They launched a massive two-year campaign of research, advocacy, and media awareness. Then, they sent a 15-page letter to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission of the United States Department of Justice, the EEOC, calling for an industry-wide federal investigation into systemic discrimination against women directors. In May 2015, the New York Times published that letter in full. It was groundbreaking. Five months later, the EEOC answered the call. The investigation was on. <laughs> it wasn't just news. It was front page news, and it rocked the industry. Agencies and unions scrambled to cover their tracks. The studios and networks fell silent. By 2016, it was reported that all six major studios had been officially charged with rampant Title VII violations and were in settlement talks with the federal government. That's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is, almost three years later, we still don't know the outcome. The EEOC functions in total confidentiality. It's, it's like a black box. Information can go in, but it can't come out. So even though we women are being represented by our government, once again, we aren't invited to the table to help design our future. So I really can't predict how this movie will end. But like all good blockbusters, the plot has thickened. <laughs> Thanks to the work of the ACLU and the EEOC, speaking out became safer. In October 2017, almost two years to the day after the investigation, the New York Times and the New Yorker published the exposés that would galvanize the Me Too movement. Harvey Weinstein became the star of his own greatest horror film ever. <laughs> and the proxy for Hollywood's way of doing business. This boys club industry functions on a system of personal relationships and reciprocity that keeps women sidelined, paid less, and vulnerable to exploitation, like trading jobs for sex. Understanding the culture of misogyny and the structures that keep women shut out makes fighting back possible. Thankfully, people are speaking out. Their voices need to be heard. Remember the stepson that directed that Law & Order episode? He turned that break into a $10 million, 20-year career and was second in line to become the president of my union, the Directors Guild of America. It all ended in 2016 when he pled, pled guilty to charges of child pornography. We need to ask ourselves, whose law, whose order? Ab abuses against the vulnerable, sexual harassment and assault in the workplace are caused by power imbalances that are rooted in employment discrimination. The way our federal government stands up to Hollywood now to make sure Title VII is enforced can change everything. But the stakes are high. 
Hollywood studios pump hundreds of millions of dollars each year into the pockets of lobbying groups in Washington, D.C. to represent their interests and avoid the very government intervention that could shift the status quo. And it's not just our government's problem. It's not just our government's job to fix this broken system. We should all be part of interrupting Hollywood. I believe that 20 years from now, we will see this as a time of extraordinary change. The paradigm shift I hoped for is happening. The signs are everywhere. For example, the world's largest advertiser, Procter & Gamble, that spent $7 billion on ads last year, has pledged to have half of its commercials directed by women by 2023. That is real action, and real change requires real action, real distribution of jobs to women, and real enforcement of Title VII. Title VII is a revolutionary law. It is the intervention that could spark a major social transformation, because equal participation of women in our cultural narrative means equal participation of women in our power structure. Let's enforce this existing law now to open the floodgates to a great new wave of female voices and creative vision. Let's use it to move humanity toward a more just and equitable future through the stories we tell and the people who tell them. And above all, let's use it so that people everywhere can believe that each one of our voices has the potential to change the world because we are the stories we tell. Thank you. Thank you.